All right, so that's what membranes are. Now, what do they do? That's what I want to deal with now. Remember, the issue that we're dealing with is the fact that the membrane is using the majority of the energy that a cell at rest is using. So right now, sitting there, your cells are primarily using energy at the membrane. About half of the energy that is being used in your body at this moment is being used by the membrane. The question is why? What's it doing? Here's what it's doing. If you look at the concentrations of these two ions, sodium and potassium, you'll notice something very interesting about any living cell in your body or any cell essentially uh, on the planet. You notice that the concentration, now remember this uh, notation here means concentration of what's inside those square brackets, so I read this as low concentration of sodium ion. The concentration of sodium ions inside the cell is always lower than outside the cell when the cell's at rest. It's not always, always lower, it's just when the cell's at rest. So that concentration difference is maintained and it's maintained it quite a bit. When I say it's a high concentration, what I mean is it's 10 times higher outside than inside. The typical concentration inside the cell is about 15 millimolar, which is millimoles per liter of solution. And the outside uh, is about 150 millimolar. Now, if you look at potassium, it's exactly different. It's exactly the opposite. Uh, it's about 10 times higher inside than outside, about 10 millimolar inside, about 150 or 140 outside. This is maintained, and this is why it needs the energy. This is why the membrane is using the energy. So why does maintaining this require so much energy? Well, the problem is that in this universe, there is this property that everything has, and it has to do with thermodynamics. I'm going to express this after the next lecture in a more precise way, but I'm going to say it this way, which may or may not make sense until the next lecture. This universe, everything seeks the lowest energy state, and that's the lowest energy state is not this. This is, a, this is a difficult energy state to maintain. So why is that? Well, again, in our universe, this happens. If you were to take a Petri dish, imagine this experiment, just take a Petri dish here and fill it full of water, and then take eyedroppers and just drop in water-soluble dye, food coloring, red dye here, green dye here, blue dye here. You just drop them in different locations. If I were to ask you what would happen, I'm sure you'd be able to answer correctly that over time, five minutes later, these colors would start to blend until eventually, maybe 10 minutes later, they're all completely blended together and the entire Petri dish has the same color, probably a gray, because that's what you're going to get when all those three pigments mix. Okay, great. That's easy. And I could even ask you, what's this process called? What's the physical process that's doing this? And again, you're probably going to know it's diffusion. So that's what's happening. This universe, things diffuse. Now the question is why? Why do things diffuse? Well, it goes back to that thermodynamic statement that I made before, things going to lowest energy state. All right, what does that mean? That's what I want to get into. If you look at the distributions of these molecules, the red molecules, green molecules, blue molecules, this is what would happen over time. All the red molecules are clustered here on one side, blue in the other, green in the middle, and then over time those distributions would start to blend and mix until eventually the distributions are all evenly flat across the way. If you think about it in terms of the actual molecules, here's a picture that depicts those. All the red molecules are clustered here, blue molecules here, and then over time they start to mix. The red molecules are still mostly over here on the left, blue mostly over here on the right, green mostly in the middle, but they're starting to mix, you can see, until eventually the probability of finding a red on this side is the same as this side, is the same as the middle, and so forth for blue and green. In other words, they're evenly distributed throughout this whole thing. Why does that happen? Well, there's different levels of answering that question is why. One level has to do with what is the energy source. Things don't move without energy being transferred from one form to another. So what is the energy source for this process? Well, remember, if something is at all above uh, zero Kelvin, okay, if you're, if you're above zero Kelvins, you are going to have some thermal energy. And that thermal energy is represented in this system as kinetic energy. These molecules, the molecules in the water, the molecules of the pigment, and the water molecules themselves are moving around because that's the thermal energy that's in the system. It's the thermal energy that's pushing everything around. So that's what's, that's what's allowing these things to move. But that only answers part of the question. The other question is, why does it move to the right? Why does it move from this ordered appearance to a more disordered appearance? Why can't it move from a disordered appearance to an ordered appearance? Well, there's nothing really stopping it. It could. It could do that. Except it doesn't. And the reason it doesn't is because of this concept called entropy. Now, I'm going to try to give you an intuitive sense of what entropy is.
it's very hard to do that accurately. And the reason it's hard to do that accurately is because energy, entropy, these other concepts are more abstract than they are intuitive. And they're concepts that come out of mathematical equations that mean certain things we try to attach uh, other conceptual meaning to, which is very difficult to do. But here's the way I want you to think about this. Imagine we can come in here and set our system up like this, and then we can magically come in and move every single molecule in here just a teeny tiny amount, just a little tiny amount. It's a random direction that we move it. So we move it randomly in any direction, just a teeny amount. And then we do it again, and then we do it again. Every time we do this, we take a picture. We take picture after picture after picture. And after we take about, I don't know, 150, 200, 300 pictures, they start to look like this. Because again, we're moving these things in all these random directions. And then after we take billions of pictures, eventually they're all going to look like this. Because again, everything, when they move, there's a much higher probability that red is going to move to the right than it is to the left because there's more space to the right. So all of these things are just pictures in time that we've taken after we've just jiggled every single one of these molecules just a tiny little bit. Now what I want to do is I want to take all of those pictures and put them into a gigantic barrel. When I put them into the barrel, I'm then going to reach into that barrel and pull out one of those pictures. And I ask you, which one is it more likely to be? The picture that I randomly choose out of all possible configurations. Now remember, some of those configurations look like this because I can jiggle these to the point where they all jiggle right back together and become nice and ordered like this. My question is this, if I pull one of these pictures out of this barrel, is it more likely to look something like this, disordered, or is it more likely to look something like this, ordered? Okay, now before you answer, realize that in that barrel are an infinite number of pictures in which these molecules are ordered. In this particular one picture, it's red, green, blue, but it could be blue, green, red, or green, red, blue, whatever. It could be any, any of those combinations. It could also be ordered in other ways, too. It could go red, green, blue, red, green, blue, red, green, blue. It could be any kind of ordering. There's an infinite number of ways that I can make it look ordered like that. So now my question is this. Is it going to look ordered, or is it going to look disordered? Well, since there's an infinite number of ways they can look ordered, it makes sense that you should be able to pull out one that looks ordered. What's weird about this is this. Even though there's an infinite number of pictures in which they're ordered in the barrel, by pulling one out, the probability that I pull one out that looks ordered is zero. Not small, not tiny, but zero. The one I pull out is guaranteed to be one that looks disordered like this because there's an infinite number of these, but there's an infinity more of these than there are of the ordered ones. That's entropy. That's why entropy exists. Over time, what you're doing is you're sampling from that barrel. Now, it's a biased sample because every time you take a sample out of that barrel, you're sampling one of the pictures where things are jiggled just a little bit. But give it enough time, give it 10 minutes, and now you're sampling from all possible configurations. And again, inside that barrel, there's an infinite number that are nice and ordered, but there's an infinity more that are disordered. And therefore, you're guaranteed to pull one of those pictures out that's disordered. That really is an expression, intuitive expression of what entropy is. And we feel it. We actually feel entropy. What you call entropy is what you, is, is what you call time. The feeling of time passing is your intuitive understanding of, of entropy in this universe. And it just turns out that in this universe, entropy is dominant. Because things always have these transition states that require entropy to at least not decrease if the system is completely closed. Now, I'm going to make all of those concepts much more precise in the next lecture. But we have to understand something. This occurs because of a very, very deep property of the universe in which the living systems exist. Therefore, there's no way around it. You can't beat this in any way. So the cell has to work against this diffusion problem. Okay, so we know things are going to diffuse for a very, very deep reason. What's going to happen in this situation? Well, we have high concentration of sodium on the outside, low concentration on the inside. What's going to happen to sodium? It won't stay this way. If it can get across that membrane, if the sodium can get across the membrane, it can't stay this way. What's going to happen? Well, just like here. I have a high concentration of red here on the left and none on the right. Eventually, it spreads out. Well, you know intuitively that's what's going to happen. The concentration of sodium is going to decrease on the inside and increase on the, on the uh, I'm sorry, decrease on the outside, increase on the inside because the sodium is going to diffuse across the membrane from right to left on average. 
potassium is going to go the, opposite, the exact opposite direction because of its difference in concentration. Now, I want to warn you about something. What I'm teaching you here is missing something very important. It's a little bit misleading, and that is that the charge across the membrane also matters. So what I'm talking about here is just the chemical gradient. I'm, not, I'm ignoring the electrical gradient. When you get to your upper division physiology class, you'll study the electrochemical gradient together, but the same result happens. Sodium is going to go to the inside, potassium will go to the outside. So what will happen over time? Well, what's going to happen is this will equilibrate. And the sodium is going to continue to move in until it's equal on both sides of the membrane, and it'll stop. Just like in this picture, the red will diffuse until it's completely equal across the entire Petri dish. So here, same thing with potassium. It'll go out until, it's e until you have a medium amount of concentration on either side, and they're equal. Except that won't happen. And the reason it won't happen is because once you get about halfway to this equil equilibrium, the cell loses control of its volume. And what happens to it every single time is it will swell and burst. There's a drug called Wabane that we can use to demonstrate this. You put Wabane on this membrane, and the Wabane will block the system, the mechanisms that are keeping this uh, concentration difference the same. And Wabane always has the same effect on cells. It causes them to lyse, L-Y-S-E, which means to explode. You've seen that term before. So, the reason why the cell has to maintain this difference of sodium and potassium across the membrane is to maintain its volume. If it loses control of sodium and potassium, it loses control of its volume. Same thing always happens. The cell explodes. It doesn't shrink. It doesn't stay the same. It always goes up and explodes. So this is critical. It's absolutely critical for every single cell in your body to maintain this difference in concentrations of sodium and potassium, or else they're going to lyse. So here's a close-up schematic of the situation. We've got the membrane here with its fatty acid tails and its phospholipid heads, the bilayer. And then we've got some solute. This is the outside of the cell, so in the extracellular compartment, the solute concentration is quite high. And then we have a low concentration of the solute in the intracellular compartment. So if this were sodium, for example, we'd have a high concentration, 150 millimolar outside, low concentration, 15 millimolar inside. And so this is the situation that we just described. The diffusion gradient goes from outside in, and so this is going to tend to want to go across this membrane. Now, here is the good news uh, for sodium. For sodium, remember, sodium is an ion. It's got a plus one charge, and this is all lipid. So the sodium can't just diffuse right through this membrane. There we go. No, no problem. All we got to do is get high concentration of sodium outside, low concentration of sodium on the inside. We're good. We don't have to do any work to actually maintain the difference because the membrane won't allow the sodium across. Unfortunately, of course, as always, it's not that simple because, remember, this is a dead membrane. This is not a living membrane. Living membranes have the integral membrane proteins in them. And it's those proteins, which I'll show you in a little bit, that allow the, uh, the sodium to get across there. Now, there are things that will do this. There are things that will diffuse right across that membrane, but they're rare. And the reason they're rare is because this is a lipid uh, bilayer. This lipid layer will not let anything that's polar or ionic, anything with a charge through, just like we talked about. So the property of this object, the property of this solute that gets through here, must be that it can dissolve in a lipid. Therefore, it must be a lipid itself, which means it must be nonpolar. The problem is, all of these things are carried as solutes in the blood. And remember, the blood is mostly water. And then the interstitial space, the space between the cells, also has a bunch of fluid in it, which is mostly water. So the things that are in your blood and the things that are bathed in the fluid bathing your cells are usually things that can dissolve in water, which is why you're water-based. So if it's going to go across the membrane, it can't do that. It's got to be held in some other way. So that's why these things are relatively rare. There are ways that you can get lipids to move through your blood, through these things called uh, low-density lipoproteins, high-density lipoproteins, very low-density lipoproteins, all these different things. But the point is that those lipids can diffuse right across that membrane as if the membrane isn't even there. So the kinds of things, for example, that can do that are the sex hormones, testosterone and estrogen. They can actually go right through here, cholesterol can go right through here, and so forth. So this is a relatively rare situation where things can diffuse right across that membrane. We call this simple diffusion because, again, it follows the simple diffusion laws and there's nothing special about it. But if this is polar or ionic, the cell has to have some other mechanism. And that's what we're going to talk about next. Okay, so how do we deal with something that will not go into solution in this nonpolar part of the membrane? For example, suppose we're looking at something like
a, an ion like sodium? How can it get through? Well, one of the things that we see embedded in membranes are these integral membrane proteins that will open up and allow ions to, to flow through the membrane. For example, what you're looking at here is an example of what's called a ligand gated channel. This is a channel that can be in two configurations. It's an integral membrane protein that can be closed like this, or it can be open like this. And it closes and opens based on whether or not there is a stimulus molecule, the ligand, L-I-G-A-N-D, that can bind to this binding site here. Now, what they're depicting here could be, for example, what we call the postsynaptic plate. This is a membrane that's on a synapse, the second part of a synapse, where the uh, other part is releasing a neurotransmitter, and that's what the stimulus molecule would be. That neurotransmitter could go in here and bind to this binding site. When it does that, it changes the tertiary structure of this channel protein. So the channel protein then opens. It's like a donut with a door. The door opens. And when it opens, it allows these ions to flow through. And again, this could be sodium, could be uh, uh, potassium, could be calcium, magnesium, any number of different ions. But these ions, again, can't get through this lipid uh, bilayer. It can only get through where this channel is open. So again, the gating, like gate, like an open swing gate in a fence, is just that. We gate this channel by opening the door by binding this ligand to it. There are other ways you can gate these channels, too. You'll study, when you take physiology, you'll study what are called voltage-gated channels. And in this case, what opens the channel is not a ligand, not a molecule binding to it, but a change in the voltage across the membrane. Another example is in your fingertips. How can you feel, for example, something uh, is cold or hot or smooth or rough? Well, it has to do with the receptors that are in the tip of your finger. As you move your fingertip, your skin will deform across the surface of what you're touching. When it deforms, that deformation will cause certain channels to open up. They're deformation-gated channels. And then those channels will then start the signal by allowing ions to flow through, usually sodium or potassium, which will change the voltage across the membrane that begins the, uh, the uh, process of sending the, the nervous signal. We're not going to talk much about that in this class. That's something you'll talk about in your physiology class and a little bit in Bio 182. But the point is that if you're talking about ions trying to get across this membrane, they do it generally through channels, and the channels tend to be gated. They don't tend to be just stuck open. In some cases they are. Like there's evidence for a chloride channel that's just open all the time. But usually they will open or close uh, just under certain conditions. So this is, again, an ion. It's, it's how it's going to work. What if you're dealing with something that's bigger than an ion? Ions are just single, uh, essentially, atoms that have been stripped of electrons or gained electrons. What about something like, for example, sugar? Can you do this with sugar? The answer is no. You can't use a channel for sugar. The channels are way too small for a big molecule like sugar to get through there. So to get sugar across the membrane, we require something different. In this case, we require another protein. It's an integral membrane protein. But that protein is not a channel. It's what we call a carrier protein. The carrier protein can be in one of two configurations, either this or this. Now, on this side, the carrier protein has a binding site for whatever molecule it's going to bind, in this case glucose, right now set to the outside. And then it'll have a binding site to the inside. In this case, these binding sites can flip back and forth randomly. So this can open up here, and when it's opened like this, a molecule of glucose will be attracted to it because, again, it has positive and negative charges that attract the negative and positive charges of the glucose, and the glucose will bind to it. And when it does that, sometimes that alone is enough to cause a change in the tertiary structure of the protein like this. So it goes into an intermediate configuration, in which case the, the uh, sugar is sort of inside the membrane. And then it can open up and release the sugar to the inside of the cell, so the sugar then can move right across the cell membrane. It can also go the other way. So the binding site is open on the intracellular side. An intracellular glucose molecule can bind to it, and it can get essentially transported out. So this carrier protein is not one that's pumping this, mo this molecule in. It's simply accepting it and allowing it to diffuse in. Okay, so I could ask you this, okay, which way is glucose going to go across this membrane? In this picture right here, which way is glucose going to go? Is it going to go to the, from outside the extra, extracellular space to the intracellular space or, or vice versa? And you might be confused because, again, this is something that's going to bind to the outside and bind to the inside with equal probability, except the probability is not equal. 
yes, this has can spend an equal amount of time with the binding site to the outside, an equal amount of time with the binding site to the inside, but there's way more glucose in this case on the outside than on the inside. Therefore, the probability that it binds glucose is higher on the outside than the inside, and so it will tend to transport it across. In fact, that's the same as any other diffusion. If you look at, the, at this other example of diffusion, things can diffuse across this membrane if they're uh, uh, nonpolar. So they go through and become uh, integrated into the intracellular uh, space. They can go right back out. So why is it that we say we diffuse from high concentration to low concentration? Well, if we go all the way back to here, you can see why. This red right here has an equal probability of going to the right or going to the left. So do all these other reds, and they can go up and down with the same probability. Over time, however, they keep mixing up because they're, they, the probability of moving is just random. Now here, where they're all organized, that randomness is biased going to where they're not because a lot of them will move to a space where there's no other red because it's just uh, a random place for them to move. But now that the red is all spread out, they're still moving randomly in exactly the same way they were before, except we don't see a difference because there's no way that they move all together or move in any way that makes it look any different. So the same thing happens here in this case. If something can diffuse across this membrane, it will always it won't always diffuse from outside to inside. It'll diffuse from out to inner, in to out. But in the long haul, if we look at all these molecules together, they're going to tend to diffuse more in than out simply because there's more outside than inside. When will it stop? When will that process stop? Well, it'll stop when there's equal concentrations on inside and outside. Then you'll have for every one that moves to the inside, you'll have another one that moves out. And so you're in equilibrium. We're looking at it from the big scale. We don't notice a difference, even though molecules are moving across the membrane easily. Same thing here. In this case, the glucose is going to move in because that concentration is higher on the inside than out. What happens when the concentration of glucose is equal on both sides of the membrane? Well, in that case, if there's equal concentrations, then it's equally likely a glucose will bind to the outside or to the inside and get transported across the membrane. In which case then, for every one that gets transported in, you'll have on average one that gets transported out and you'll see no difference. All three of these have that property. All three of these mechanisms of membrane transport going either just diffusing right across the membrane, which we call simple diffusion, or diffusing through an ion channel and diffusing through these proteins, which are called carrier proteins. All of them are forms of diffusion. The only difference is the membrane property changes based on the integral membrane protein that happens to be there. In this case, the carrier protein is what's carrying the large organic molecule, polar molecule across. Now, that's the key to this. It has to be a large polar molecule. Okay, so now we see diffusion, and essentially a cell is going to use diffusion whenever it can. It'll, it'll be pulling these things across the membrane as much as it can using diffusion. But in order to use diffusion, you have to have a concentration difference, and it has to be going in the correct direction. In this case, the cell needs to sequester sugar. Why? Because it's going to use that sugar to transform the energy on the sugar molecule into another uh, form, typically ATP. So it needs the sugar for an as an energy source. So that's why it's constantly pulling it in. It's using up that sugar, so the concentration on the inside of the cell is usually low. And so it can move in. But there are times when you have to get the sugar completely out of one compartment and into another compartment. An example is in the kidney. The situation in the kidney is depicted here. What you've got is this object. Let's take a look at this green thing. This right here is what's called a nephron. And this is one of the main functional units in the kidney. Each kidney has about a million of these. And it's got this section right here, which is called Bowman's capsule. This section right here, which is called the proximal convoluted tubule, called proximal because it's close to Bowman's capsule. And then there's this thing called the loop of Henle. And then the distal convoluted tubule, and then this thing called the collecting duct. You're going to study all of that when you get into Bio 182 and into your physiology course. What I want to focus on, though, is this right here, this thing called the proximal convoluted tubule. So we power up on that. This is Bowman's capsule. And here we have a blood vessel coming in to a specialized capillary called a glomerulus. And the blood uh, then flows out of the glomerulus. And here's where the, the blood is filtered in the kidney. Now the filtrate then goes into Bowman's capsule and then enters this tubule here at the proximal convoluted tubule. What comes out of the blood is all of the stuff that's dissolved in the blood except for the proteins. And of course, the cells are not uh, filtered out as well. So what's filtered here is everything in the blood except the cells and the proteins, and that stuff is called serum. 
and it's basically just a sugar solution with some salt in it and with some other things that dissolved in it. Uh, the sugar concentration of that serum is about 100 milligrams per 100 mils of serum, uh, which is a fair amount of sugar. And the problem is this, that sugar that gets uh, uh, filtered out here must get reabsorbed back into the blood. The reason is that your brain is absolutely dependent on that sugar. It can't really store any energy like many of the other cells in your body can. And so without the sugar, without having that level of, of sugar in your blood, your brain starts to, to malfunction. So your kidney has to completely reabsorb all of that sugar. And if you're healthy and you have a healthy diet, uh, that is no problem. You have no problem doing that. All of that reuptake of the sugar occurs here in the proximal convoluted tubule. Now, unlike this situation where we have sugar on one side and, uh, of a membrane and sugar on the other side of a membrane, this situation oops, is quite different because something else more significant has to happen. Here, remember, if the sugar on the outside has the same concentration as the sugar on the inside of this membrane, then the whole process stops because the sugar goes through and goes out at the same rate. We can't do that here. Because if there's sugar here and we reabsorb it into the cells, and that's what these are depicting here, if we look right here, this is right along the edge of the proximal convoluted tubule. This is a cell layer. And what happens then is that this is the layer where that filtrate is, and here's where the blood is. And so what the cell is doing is absorbing the glucose, and the glucose then is then put into the blood. And you can follow these arrows, glucose to inside, and then inside to the blood. It has to get all of it out and it can't use diffusion because if it's using diffusion along this membrane, then when the glucose concentration in the filtrate is equal to the glucose concentration inside the cells, then this whole process stops. So what you've got to do is you have to find a way either to get rid of the glucose on the inside, which means you've got to put it outside in the blood, and the blood is fixed. The blood is fixed, fixed at 100 milligrams per 100 mils. So if you're going to try to get all of this glucose out of here, you're going to at some point have to push against the concentration gradient where you're pushing the glucose into a higher concentration versus the low concentration. That's the only way to get all of the glucose out of the filtrate. And again, physiologically, under normal healthy physiological conditions, that's exactly what you do. So therefore, diffusion can't do it because once you get everything to 100 milligrams per 100 mils right here, then the cell will get to 100 milligrams per 100 mils, then the filtrate will get to 100 milligrams per 100 mils, and that's the best you're going to be able to do. So the technique then is different. We have to find a different way to actually solve this problem. So what the cells have to do, what your body has to do, is this. If this is this blood that's been filtered, you have to get all of the sugar completely out of the blood and into the cell. And then the cell will dump it back into the bloodstream. So that process is very different than these. And you see why. Here, the sugar is moving in the direction from a high concentration to low concentration. In this case, it has to move from a direction of low concentration to high concentration. Physics does not like that. This universe does not like that. The universe is going always towards a lower energy state. And in this case, you have to get it to move towards a higher energy state. So the only way that the universe is going to allow you to do that is if you use metabolic energy. You're going to have to find some way of using metabolic energy to actually pump this sugar across this membrane. The metabolic energy typically comes from a molecule of adenosine triphosphate, ATP. The ATP is what's being produced by the mitochondrion. So here is what you have to eat for. You literally have to eat to make that ATP so that you can do this kind of thing and pump things across the membrane in the opposite direction of this uh, concentration gradient. So those are four of the major mechanisms, the simple mechanisms of membrane transport. This is simple diffusion. This is diffusion through a channel protein. This is what we call facilitated diffusion because it's diffusion facilitated by a carrier protein. And then this is called active transport. It's active because it's using metabolic energy. I'm going to test you on this in the following way. I'm going to ask you to determine, to predict, what mechanism of membrane transport is going to be used in a given situation. So for example, let's look at glutamine. Glutamine is an amino acid. It's polar, as you know, because it has a amine group, which has a plus charge, and a, a, the acid group, the carboxyl group, which has a negative charge. And cells need to get that out of the bloodstream and into themselves. And if they're happy to keep the concentration in the blood equal to the concentration inside of them, what mechanism of transport will they use? Now, they're always going to use diffusion when they can. And as long as they can get uh, enough of the material inside them, themselves,
they'll use diffusion in this the scenario I just painted when the cell is going to be happy to have equal concentrations of glutamine inside and outside will not require anything other than diffusion so it'll diffuse but now the question is what kind will it diffuse using simple diffusion well no it can't because gl glutamine is a polar molecule it can't go through the membrane what about an ion channel? It can't do that either because it's way too big. It's an organic molecule. It's not an ion, so it's too big. The only choice that it has then is the facilitated diffusion using the carrier protein. Okay. Now, suppose we have this. Membranes inside muscle cells, inside what's called the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which is a very specialized form of the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, need to resequester calcium. Whenever a muscle re uh, contracts, it releases a bunch of calcium from this membrane. When the muscle relaxes, it has to pull all of that calcium back up into it, all of it, 100% of it. So therefore, at some point, on one side of the membrane, you're going to have a low concentration of, of um, uh, calcium and a high concentration on the other side, and you need, you need to get it to go from low to high. Okay, so which mechanism of transport is it going to use? You should answer in this case uh, active transport because it has to go against the concentration gradient. It won't use an ion channel because it has to go against the concentration gradient, and ion channels can only go with concentration gradient. So it doesn't matter what kind of molecule it is. If it's going against the concentration gradient, it's always active transport. If it's a polar molecule, it cannot use simple diffusion. It has to use either a channel protein or facilitated diffusion. If it's a large polar molecule, it has to use uh, the facilitated diffusion. If it's an ion, it'll use a small ion anyway, it will use an ion channel, and if it is nonpolar, then it will use simple diffusion. So that's what you got to remember when you take the quiz, because the quiz is going to ask you a number of questions and deal with things exactly in that way.